Welcome, everybody. I see some folks are starting to log in. Um, thanks for joining our Ask Mayfield Anything uh, for uh, May 2023. Um, appreciate everybody taking the time to, to join us. So a uh, little bit of housekeeping before we move into this too much. Um, we are, you know, we, we try and make this as conversational, as open as possible. So there is a Q&A section of the webinar. So if you open it up in your, um, when you log in, you'll see a Q&A. That is the best place to ask us questions. So as you're going along, as we're going along, uh, doing a presentation, if there's something that comes up, uh, welcome questions all along the way. I'll try and interject those in as we can. So feel free to, to throw those out there. Um, it's easiest if you use the Q&A, not the chat section. Uh, it just makes it easier for us to, to uh, keep track of all those and make sure that we get them uh, questions answered the best we can. So, so with that, uh, we'll jump in. I see um, kind of settled down on the people joining. So again, thanks for joining us. Um, this is our Ask Mayfield, Any Ask Mayfield Anything series. My name is Ryan Mayfield, uh, founder of Mayfield Renewables. I've uh, been in the industry for... Uh, since 99. Um, so we've done a lot of things. Uh, started off as an installer. Uh, I've been doing um, design engineering, uh, educating for a number of years now. So I uh, appreciate you joining us here. Real quick, a little bit about Mayfield Renewables in case you don't know who we are, uh, what we do. So again, I founded Mayfield Renewables 2007. So over you know 16 years ago now. And the core, at the core of our company is, you know, we're doing a lot of, we, we do education work, we educate in kind of all of our business lines. So we're a technical consultancy where we work with uh, EPCs on uh, design and engineering side of the business uh, for commercial industrial, small, small utility scale, and also microgrid systems. And then we also have uh, consultant work, consulting work that we do both on the project side, uh, microgrids, working with EPCs as projects come up. And then on the product side, we work with manufacturers as well. So all of those things kind of kind of culminate in uh, a lot of the education that we do. And so it's you know a joy for me to be able to do these kinds of webinars, work with uh, folks like um, David and Ross who are on the uh, webinar with us today. So um, yeah, so if there's anything that we may be able to um, help and support you with, you know, feel free to reach out. So with that, uh, I want to introduce today's guests. You know, part of our AMA series is to bring on folks that are in the industry working on specific areas. And today we're talking about connectors, both on the AC and the DC side of the system. Uh, so we have Ross Murphy, uh, who's the Northeast Business Development Manager uh, for Renewables at Hubble. Uh, Ross brings, you know, his engineering expertise in into helping working with developers, engineers, and installers uh, in applying the different products that Hubble uh, has to offer. So uh, Ross, thanks for joining. Um, I guess, any, what did I miss uh, in terms of your, your introduction there? Nope, I think, uh, I think all is well. That was uh, well done. Okay, well, welcome. And then we also have uh, David Penalva. Sorry, I know I didn't say that quite right, but um, co-founder of Helio Volta. Uh, HelioVolt is a third-party QA, QC firm, uh, and they are um, a technology solutions company as well. So they have SolarGrade is um, another part of their company. And so uh, David has some, some good screenshots and will show us some of the um, stuff that they're doing, um, but very involved in going out and doing site evaluations, or I should say maybe assessments, uh, and you know looking at installation maybe issues, um, you know, went and coming in as a um, expert uh, to to help troubleshoot. So uh, David, welcome. Um, I guess miss anything on Helio Volta or SolarGrade there? No, I think we're good. Thank you for having us. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, so let's jump in uh, and talk about this. And so uh, we're talking about PV connectors uh, and the 2020 NEC. So PV connector is kind of a big term. I think when I, when, I know when I hear that, when I say it, you know, I think I, I focus in on the DC side, uh, but we also have some connectors over on the AC side. And there's been some changes in the 2020 NEC that, you know, um, have implications on both the DC and the AC side. So that's kind of how we broke it up. Um, by all means, 
you know, there's, uh, I think the both of the panelists will have information on on both sides of the system, um, but that's kind of how we broke it down uh, for you to to start thinking about it. And the where I'll start, and you know, we'll use this as the launching pad, and then we'll go from here. But we're going to start over on the DC side. And so again, when I hear connectors, I always think of the quick connects. Um, you know, multi contact is you know we we very often refer to them as the MC connectors, just kind of the brand name that stuck. Um, but the quick connects on the back of PV modules, back on our on the back of or you know, attached to our um, module level power electronics. And in the 2020 NEC, we have this intermatability requirement. And again, so this is code playing, I guess, a little bit of catch up in the sense of we have seen issues in the past where we have connectors. Um, on, that are uh, not of the same manufacturer. And so we get, we've had within the industry, manufacturers tell us that they're compatible with other manufacturers. And at this point, you know, most manufacturers will say that there's no listing um, there. And I think that's, you know, an absolute true statement. There's no listing saying that they are compatible. So code has made this, you know, very clear. We have to um, have conductors that are uh, the same identical type and brand or listed and identified for intermatability. And so I think, you know, and so in this case, we have a, a couple of photos. These are uh, from Healy Volta and, you know, some examples of they fit together, they, you know, they click. Uh, and so they must be okay to use. And I think that's been part of what we've seen in the industry. Um, David, I don't know if you want to add on to that at all. Uh, no, I, th I think that's um, what, you know, the topic of today is just really covering the, you know, the, the problem that I think the code has been laid to uh, address. Yep. So, so that's, I mean, kind of the, you know, that's the, the, the stick, I guess you could say, I mean, this is what we're kind of being forced to, to do. And so I think this comes down into, you know, so what are the best practices? How are we going to do it? And, and I think probably even taking a step back and uh, David, I think that's what you're going to do, you know, kind of take a step back, what, you know, addressing the problem, kind of how it cascades down. Um, and you have some really cool images to show us on the technology that you guys can use after the fact, if you're coming in and doing some, some, um, some forensics. So let's jump into that. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, you know, some of the, the minor mistakes. So you want to walk us through what we're looking at here, David? Yeah. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, we wanted to bring uh, our experience uh, going over hundreds of thousands of connectors inspected in the field, kind of bring that uh, experience here and, and share with everyone in the audience uh, some of the findings and the root causes of, of these uh, problems that we identified. In fact, most projects that we inspect have some type of connector related issue. Uh, the frustrating part of uh, going through documenting these issues in the field, that's what uh, inspired us to develop SolarGrid which is a field work management software application that allows uh, optimizing and streamlining the process of uh, finding and reporting issues associated to connectors, for example. Um, you know, uh, here in this slide, we're seeing a few photos of uh, connectors uh, with uh, major problems that cause uh, a lot of issues uh, at the price that, that were installed, not necessarily just uh, performance related, but also safety, on in some rear and uh, rear and extreme cases can cause you know thermal events or fires. Um, yeah, ne next slide. If we, yeah, if we uh, really want to talk about intermediability, which is part of the topic today, uh, I think um, something that we need to reflect on is that connector problems usually start early on in the in the in the development stages of the project. So uh, during design and engineering and procurement. A few examples here are uh, traditional, uh, historically model manufacturers have not really um, defined uh, the connect the specific connectors that the models were going to come from. Um, that meant that if you know if you were working on a utility scale project, for example, where that EPC was more sophisticated and they could negotiate the bill of materials of the uh, of the model, the the connectors might might have been specified. But for the CNI space, that's really not a um, a route that has been followed traditionally. Uh, so that's one that's one part of the problem, really uh, knowing what you're gonna get. And it's understandable that model manufacturers usually have several suppliers for connectors 
and they certify their products with different suppliers as well for supply chain uh, reasons. And therefore, really knowing what you're going to get is, is a key issue already. Uh, if you combine that with now the additional uh, components that are used in uh, solar installations like model level power electronics, such as optimizers or rapid shutdowns, that have also to be compliant with the code and therefore have to be mateable uh, with regards to connectors. Now you have a problem that you need to really specify connectors in both products to be able to connect them. Otherwise, you, you have to use, uh, you either cross made them, that's what used to happen in the past. Hopefully, this doesn't continue now that is a code requirement. But uh, uh, a solution that we're seeing now in the field, which in our opinion is, is, is a really bad solution, is the use of jumpers. And these jumpers will uh, will allow uh, to have to avoid the cross mating to comply with code, but you're duplicating the the potential failure points in an installation for 20, 30 years, which is not an ideal solution. Just because you didn't do your homework in preparation for for that issue. The other uh, pr example here is with regards to spare parts. Uh, a lot of these connectors need to be. Uh, need to be cross made it with the field made connectors of the home runs or the cable harnesses. And that's another layer, like, you know, some, some installers or EPCs might not have uh, avail uh, availability of the connectors that they require for the products. And if they didn't um, request those connectors from the model manufacturer in advance, you run a, uh, into a problem where in order to continue with the project, you have to cross made the connectors. And that's uh, a lot of the issues that we see. Um, and so, Davi, just a point of clarification. So, when you're saying cross mating, you're talking about using a connector from two different manufacturers. One from, I'll just use the manufacturers. I know Stoively and Amphenol, let's say, um, yes. and yeah. and using making that connection. So that would be an example of a, a cross connect, cross mating. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, but um, moving uh, moving to the next slide, uh, we uh, you know cross mating or intermediability problems is not just the only problem that we see with connectors. We see a lot of issues with connectors. Uh, here in this slide, uh, I wanted to kind of bring up some uh, issues that could be identified visually. Uh, on the table on the right, uh, we can see uh, from a, a connector that is partially con partially connected, so it's not connected all the way through, that causes uh, uh, problems with regards to the metal pins being uh, touching completely to each other mechanically. And that can cause, you know, overheating. Uh, also, uh, signs of thermal deformation, as well as uh, the next uh, part on the right. So, cross threading of the back nut, or torquing, under torquing, or inconsistency of number of threads. That implies that the installer has not been following the procedures. Uh, otherwise, uh, there should be consistency on the number of threads exposed when installing uh, uh, connectors. Uh, as well as a few examples on the bottom uh, with uh, poor, poor uh, installation practices where connectors get exposed to sunlight or, uh, you know, they get sitting on water pullings on, or in the roof membranes, as well as uh, excessive uh, vent radius, as well as, uh, you know, some examples of cross on the On the left side of the screen, we see, uh, you know, uh, a connector that had a water ingress uh, due to poor um, uh, you know, the, the bug nut in this case was loose and therefore allowed water ingress uh, to the inside. You can see the uh, metal uh, pin already corroding. Uh, on the bottom, there's a thermal deformation connector. On the bottom right uh, center, we can see a connector that was over torque on the right side uh, and then under torque or not properly torque on the left side. Uh, a way of checking the, the, the torquing, one way of visually uh, Verifying the torquing on, on the connector back nut is by uh, looking at the insulator body of the connector that has these fingers. Uh, that if they look straight, is because the the connector was never uh, properly torqued because those uh, fingers usually deform permanently in in a twisted uh, uh, shape. So that's a, a way kind of visually to verify. Is that? Is that something you can see with that nut, that back nut? So, I, so just to be clear, so in that uh, the pictures, those four pictures on the left hand side, the the top right one there shows one with a nut on and one with a nut off. Yeah. Would you be able to see that? Uh, 
deformity on those those fingers um, around the the conductor with that nut in place? No, you you typically see the back nut. Uh, the case on the right, the right back nut is actually properly torqued. Um, it, that one on the left will have five almost five threads visible, and therefore once you remove it, you realize you can see that it was not properly torqued. You have to remove it. If you remove a, a back nut that was properly torqued and is twisted, the problem is that you have technically you have to complete that connector. It's kind of a destructive uh, way of verifying. If you're so, very sure that it's uh, under torque, it's, it's, it usually comes up very easily when, when it's completely loose. So even taking the back nut off would be considered a destructive check and you'd have, you technically should be replacing that entire connector. Exactly, yeah. Wow, okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of a lot of installers, when you tell them that they didn't torque the connectors properly, the, the first reaction they have is just to go and over torque them uh, right on the spot. Uh, technically, you know, not not approved by the manufacturers, but we see that all the time. Okay. So going backwards a little bit, I mean, question came up. So you mentioned, you know, one way of overcoming uh, different connectors on your components you're you're connecting to or you're attaching would be to use jumpers, and it's one that you don't recommend. Is there a recommended practice that you've seen or that has been accepted by manufacturers um, in order to, to yeah, avoid the, connectors? The recommended practice is really plan ahead for avoiding the use of jumpers. I, jumpers is the only, you either cross made or you use jumpers. I don't think, I mean, cross made is not allowed by code now, but jumpers is not a, it's a technical solution, but I don't think it's a great technical solution for uh, avoiding this issue. So, so one thing, and you know, I've done lots of presentations, talked to folks at NABSEP and places like that. And so one of the things that has come up is you know, cutting off those connectors on one of the components and replacing it with the proper one. Um, if, you know, so I'm, <laughs> that's a tough one to say and to um, condone or to, you know, say is a, is a good practice to do because now you're, you're cutting off a, you know, you're, you're, um, you're uh, changing a listed component, right? So if you do it on the PV module, you cut off the module. Now all of a sudden you've changed yeah. with that listed module, um, its components. And so there's in of itself a violation of code because you know, you're not installing to the manufacturer's instructions. Um, I have had people, I have not personally been able to verify this or you know go through and talk to manufacturers, but I have been told from some people that they've been able to get module manufacturers specifically to okay that practice uh, in order to avoid the the mismatch uh, connectors. So I think the the options are very few um, as we're probably all painfully aware. Um, but if you know just cutting them off and putting a new one on is not necessarily the right answer either. Exactly. And, and that's not feasible if you're uh, dealing with uh, model power electronics because now you have one-to-one -one ratio and therefore that means that you have to really you know replace pretty much cut all the all, all connectors. That works when you have to do home runs, for example. Right. Yeah. So I guess if you're doing a string inverter system and you're uh, make, making your home runs, the you know make the home runs with the right connectors and you avoid that solution altogether. Yeah. But if you're doing something with MLPEs and they have different uh, connectors on them, uh, to your point, if you can plan for it, but you know even then sometimes probably you know modules are going to show up on site as you mentioned. They're going to have multiple manufacturers, uh, multiple runs, things like that. Exactly. Uh, moving on to the next uh, next slide, uh, talking about the root causes. Uh, you know, if you really think about the 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 root causes of most of these common problems, uh, fall within these four categories. One is uh, using the wrong parts, so not UL listed uh, products or NAC compliant. So this cross meeting uh, that we were talking about. Then lack of training when making the connectors in the field uh, or improper tooling when making connectors in the field. And the fourth one is uh, faulty, uh, faulty ma materials and components. And that's more, uh, you know, serial defect or a manufacturer problem uh, rather than a kind of an installation practice. The three, the first three categories could seriously be avoided by just reading the manuals from, that come from the, you know, the, the connector manufacturers. They put a lot of work into uh, creating these manuals. Uh, they specify very clearly the tools that you should be using and how you should be making. Uh, a lot of these companies, uh, you know, offer uh, a lot of support um, 
to, to train uh, personnel and it's highly recommended. Uh, you know, funny funny fact was the the T-shirt uh, read uh, the free manual uh, from the NAF set. Um, I thought it was great. That was yeah, so this, this was a, a shout out to to Greg Smith there. Read read the read the manual. Um, and so yes, yeah, so I and I think to that point of uh, training, uh, speaking with manufacturers, Stoigley, I know for a fact, you know, we uh, reached out to them. We weren't able to make a connection here to have them on uh, this specific webinar, which is, you know, um, you know, unfortunate that we weren't able to make the timing work out, but they are very accessible as, you know, as, as a very specific manufacturer in terms of uh, coming in, doing trainings. I know that they, you know, they've done training for our our team on the engineering side. I know that they will come out to job sites and things like that. So, um, if those are the main, if those are the connectors you're using, um, you know, leaning in on those resources is important. It's um, they're there, and you should definitely do that. Um, real quick, do you know, David? Um, the you mentioned the gap in the threads, and you showed a couple that were over and under torqued. Uh, is there a standard in terms of number of threads? Um, that should be showing uh, on those connectors when you're when people are torquing them together. Yeah, that is, it's a tricky. No, there's not a standard on that. Uh, typically, if the backnut is bottom up to the body of the connector, that's a problem with pretty much every single connector manufacturer. So the backnut being all the way touching the body of the connector, that's for thermal expansion and traction of the metal pins. This is not. Uh, that's the kind of big no no. If uh, threads are being exposed. Typically over four, and that's just a rule of thumb that that I, with experience, I kind of I kind of tell that once you start seeing more than four threads, that gets in the in the gray area where is this back not properly torqued? Because in order to show four threads, that means that the combination of the cable thickness on all the you know parts inside uh, doesn't allow you to kind of go all the way through to get to the three point five newton meters that are required. 3.5 to 3. Point, depending on the manufacturer, they have different specs. That does those are for stubbly. Um, you know, there's some variance there, but okay. you you can also the checking of the torque after the fact is 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 not feasible. You you know these plastics once they are sitting outside, you cannot check the torque after the fact. You cannot retort them, and you cannot check it after the fact. So that means that it's very difficult to tell. Uh, if it's properly torqued, what there's some cases that is very obvious. It just touches and it spins right away, like with very little effort. And then you, 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 it gets subjective because each person has different strength in their hands and, and fingers, and you can you really don't know how much strength are you doing on trying to un untorque the back nut to see if it's torqued properly. So uh, not very scientific on that regard, but I think with experience you get a, an idea of uh, what's good and what's bad. Sure. And, and again, it's going to be the manufacturers will specify what that is, what the torque values are, what the right tools are to use and all that, all those things. Exactly. Cool. So next slide, uh, with regards to tools, uh, one issue that we keep seeing is the use of improper tooling uh, when making these connectors from the, you know, plastic uh, wrenches that come with, uh, from the connector manufacturers that uh, in a lot of cases are used just to, uh, torque the connectors, uh, which doesn't really get to the proper torquing on a lot of, uh, you know, installers think that that's the case, uh, to the use of uh, pliers or wrenches, normal wrenches just to torque connectors and not giving the importance to using the proper tooling um, as part of the, the process. So does each manufacturer include, you know, the, the list of tools? I mean, I know on the, the crimp on the inside, there's a specific tool um, in a, and there's a presuming there's a tool as well for on the torque side is there like torque specs and a, a specific wrench they say to use yes they most manufacturers have their their own tools that they sell apart in fact i think ul 6703 if i'm not mistaken the certification for the connectors is of the of the assembly so you have to Basically, you have to, in order to comply with the with the UL standard, you have to use the right the, the tools that were used to to uh, to go through testing. So uh, technically, you don't comply with the standard if you don't use the right tools. Okay. Ne next slide. Um, so when we um, come across a systemic 
systemic issues with connectors on uh, you know asset owners or um, you know asset owners want to learn more or want to want to understand more about what the actual root cause of the problem was that is uh, not uh, necessarily visible. We use these advanced uh, techniques to be able to uh, explore or go deeper into understanding the root cause. Uh, there are different different techniques uh, that could be used. Uh, material char characterization is one. So the first, uh, you know, two different tests uh, listed here. And then you can do uh, cross sectioning, or you can use X-ray computer tomography uh, (XCT), which allows you to um, to visualize the interior features of solid objects. It's a non-destructive testing. Even though you have to remove the connectors in the field, and technically you're not going to put them back, but it allows you to to create uh, these. X-ray images that um, shows the plastics and the metals, so we, we can really get into a deep, deeper understanding on what's going on. Uh, in this uh, specific image, uh, and the, the way these images are taken is by taking X-rays at different intensities, and um, then you move the, you know, you move the uh, the piece or the, the specimen in. Uh, at a different angle and then take more slices of x-rays and then you take more images and at different angles and once you complete like a full um a full 360 you're able to uh, assemble all these uh, photos and create like a 3d model out of the specific part uh, which is very cool um in this specific photo that we're seeing uh that was uh, from an article that we wrote with in collaboration with uh, pbell uh, shows a connector that has uh, has the metal pins in the center not fully inserted, as you as you can see. On uh, the connector on the left side of, uh, is uh, the the pin, the metal pin was not properly inserted into the uh, plastic body, and didn't make it all the way through. And therefore, when they connected the connector, physically the connector connected the the, the clips of the outside body of the connector connected, but the metal pin was not fully inserted, and therefore. Uh, the surface contact was, was very small and that was causing overheating. Uh, is that what we're seeing on the center there where it's kind of the, the darker the purplish gap. color? Yeah, yeah. The empty gap in the center uh, yeah. represents the, you know, basically the pin, if the male pin should have gone all the way or most of the way inside. Uh, the oh, pin. interesting. Okay. So it's basically an air gap um, is what we're looking at in that sense. Yeah, an air gap and a, and a very small surface uh, contact point. Okay. Uh, next slide, we have a few uh, animations here uh, that as part of the XCT uh, technique. So in this case, we're seeing two different images, one on the left, which is uh, filtering out in the histogram, uh, histogram of the connector to, sh uh, to show us only the middle uh, parts. And we're, we're conducting a scanning of a cross section that you can see on the right side. Uh, showing uh, basically the metal uh, me metallic journey of the connector. So you go from the cable to the crimp to the metal pins to the central connection and the uh, the the uh, the cage ring that uh, actually makes the the contacts, and then uh, you can see the the bottom uh, uh, crimp as well. In this specific connector, it goes uh, fairly fast, but if you look at the bottom section of the uh, sorry the bottom crimp. You can see that one of the wings of the crimp is not holding uh, cable strands, and the reason for that is because when the the person that or you know whoever made this connector the crimp uh, was stripping the cables, they stripped uh, uh, nine strands of cable, and therefore about twenty percent of the twenty percent of the uh, you know, cable section was lost and didn't make it all the way to the to the crimp in this case, which creates problems with you know opacity and and then you know could create problems of overheating. So in this case, I mean, when when we slowed it down and really looked at it, you could see. So somebody took their strippers and maybe they used the the twelve gauge section instead of the ten gauge or something like that, and they actually cut some of those strands. And so there was strands physically missing and then when they went to put it in that crimp there's just nothing there for that crimp to grab onto and so you can see kind of that hole uh, and so yeah that loss of ampacity uh, in this case yeah so i think this is a i mean this is an incredible um you know technology thing that you guys are doing 
So I guess where where would this be used? When would this be used? Um, this is you know this is something that's done in the lab, as I understand it. So this isn't yeah. something you're going and doing out in the field. Um, but what would be the application here? Like when would somebody go so far as to take this to to do this XCT um, uh, imagery? Uh, typically, in uh, in cases where we have systemic uh, problems with connectors, and the root cause is not ex extremely clear. So now you have, you know, it could be from the connector, you know, could be manufacturing related issues or installation uh, issues. But uh, with this uh, technique, it allows you to kind of go on on a deeper level to really see what 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 was the problem, and therefore uh, to be able to you know, to take actions on, on uh, remediation um, uh, practices moving forward. Usually it, it helps with the case of some type of warranty claim, either with the EPC or the, the manufacturer or, or whoever uh, might be involved in the process uh, here. So you're going and you're taking a, a sample, a representative sample from the, from the field in this case or something, and you're actually cutting off these connectors and sending it into the lab in order to do this analysis. Yes, um, yeah. we, we take specimens, document the uh, locations, um, uh, you know, all the information associated to the to the samples collected, and then send them to the lab, do the analysis, and then provide results and recommendations for uh, next steps. So here's a question that came in um, saying, you know, can you calculate the before and after crimp compaction ratio with the XCT? Um, so I, I feel like. I'll, I'll let you answer that, and maybe I'll expand on it as needed. Uh, the compression uh, rate uh, could be calculated with XCP, which is really cool. You you can stop the cross section at the crank and do the do the math uh, on this, and you know you also have the cable cable, cable strength, the the section of each strength, uh, each strength, and you can you can go as deep as calculating the compression rates. Cool, awesome. So next slide and final slide. Uh, well, I have another one, but next slide is uh, show us kind of a, uh, here we're playing with the histogram of the XCP and showing the plastics versus the metal densities. Uh, this is uh, very useful as well to understand issues associated to the plastics. Uh, sometimes uh, some of the problems that you see are consequences of, you know, for example, the O-rings uh, being displaced or the gaskets uh, not properly sealing or cross thread uh, back nuts that will, uh, you know, allow moisture ingress because they're, they're not or proper torquing or uh, things like that. You can you can see a lot of issues um, when looking uh, at the plastics layer in conjunction in conjunction to looking at the at the metal piece. So, uh, yeah. If, any questions or I'll, I'll move on to the next, the final. I think there was a question, but I think it's pretty straightforward. So um, question about, you know, the the failure on these images that you've done, you know, was there, did something manifest actually coming out and doing this? And I believe the answer is yes, these were actual, you know, uh, root, root um, you know, cause analysis that you were doing because of some, some failures out in the field. And so these were actual um, connectors. These these weren't made as an example. Uh, these were actually pulled from field yes, yeah, uh, sites. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they are yeah. real, real uh, images from samples that we have taken. Yep. Okay. So just to wrap it up, uh, with regards to best practices, again, I think uh, you know the the best way to avoid issues is to really um, start with a proper specification of connectors. Uh, from early stages, make sure that doing engineering and design, everything gets very clearly specified, and that gets through uh, procurement negotiations. So you actually get the the right connectors. Uh, so you're avoiding intermediability and ideally jumpers. The use of jumpers, uh, then installation of the right connectors. Actually making sure that you get the right connectors, um, and they are installed properly, as well as some type of QAQC. We we still even though companies are really making a big effort on having the, you know, the first three points here addressed. And still in the field, you have a lot of people that are newcomers to the industry that haven't, you know, gone through proper training and they sometimes don't know exactly what they're doing. So having QAQC 
uh, on site is always a you know huge uh, huge value added on um, regularly spec uh, connectors throughout the project lifetime. I mean, it's something that uh, usually has been neglected for many years. So you you connected the connector, they were underneath. They're usually very difficult to inspect. I mean, it really is, they're hidden out there. They're usually not accessible. And um, it's something that in, you know, back in the day was not included as part of the O&M uh, preventive maintenance uh, uh, practices. So it's something that we, uh, definitely recommend. Cool. Yeah, a question came up, you know, what should an asset owner do if they think that there's, you know, system-wide connector issues? And I guess my response would be, you know, get in touch with David and Helio Volta and, um, and, you know, going through and seeing if, you know, an analysis uh, is is the right path. But I think that would be one of the, you know, a third party uh, evaluation of it would be the, the right answer, in my opinion, there. Cool. cool. Okay. So let's jump into uh, talking about some of these um, AC connectors as well. So we'll give David a, a second here to catch his breath and uh, Ross, have you talk about some of this stuff. Um, the other side of the system, so you know, moving away from PV connectors over to the AC side and really gonna focus in on supply side connections. And the reason why focusing in on this is uh, 2020 code 240.36, talks about spliced and tapped conductors. And there's this requirement for suitable for the use on the uh, marked, excuse me, the um, distribution blocks, pressure connectors, devices, uh, they need to be listed for suitable for use on the line side of service equipment. Um, we did get a little bit of a reprieve. You can see here um, until January 1st of this year. So really, if you are using 2020 code, uh, we are, um, past this date now. And so we're seeing that we need to have these devices listed uh, and marked suitable for the use on the line side of service equipment. So um, SR service rated is kind of what I think kind of um, going to be talking about here. So, um, so yeah, so I wanted to um, have Ross on uh, from Hubble to kind of talk about that, kind of what those listings look like, uh, what that equipment is. And so we can um, start talking about with some of those, you know, starting with some distribution blocks and things like that. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so I'll, I'll get going into this. And um, first and foremost, just, you know, more background on Hubble and Hubble being uh, made up of about 80 different manufacturers. Um, today, we're mostly with respect to the 230.46 code provision, going to be focusing on our Burndy product line or Burndy connectors. Um, historically, we would see, or our concentration right now is on three styles or three different styles of connectors that would be used in this application. First and foremost would be our power distribution blocks. Uh, that photo there is up in the top left-hand corner. Um, in this case, we have a, a, a pretty large run conductor tapping off to potentially six, um, six other taps. Um, secondarily, a uh, pretty popular solution up until this SR rating would be, our, would be insulation piercing connectors. Uh, those insulation piercing connectors easy, easily installed um, and really just one run and then a tap conduct, conductor as well. Um, and then lastly would be insulated multi-port mechanical connectors. Um, for us, we would refer to that as Unitap. Um, there are many other manufacturers of this style and many different configurations. Um, I know we manufacture that up into about 12 separate ports and in different configurations. Um, in, in all cases, these connectors would be rated for 600 volts, aluminum and copper conductors or connections, and in the case of the power distribution blocks and the multi-port mechanical connectors, we do require stripping of conductors and then the proper torque, uh, torque value to be applied to that connection as well. In the case of the insulation piercing connectors, no stripping required, hence that ease of installation there. Um, you can move on to the next slide, Ryan. Um, so I'm gonna kind of concentrate on both the power distribution blocks and the, the Unitap or uh, me mechanical multi-port connections. As it stands today, Hubble slash Burndy's power distribution blocks do have a SR rating. So that is the solution we are presenting to uh, the industry specifically for residential and, and commercial applications. 
uh, when we get into obviously the utility scale or even community scale, ground mount solar, uh, a lot of different other applications and maybe not even this uh, national electric code may be in effect. Uh, but due to the prior listings of our power distribution blocks and having a short circuit current rating of a 100 kA, they simply, it was a, an, an easy fit to meet that SR rating that UHEL has. And we'll go into a little bit more of the testing that is required or, or uh, the UL references for that testing. Um, with respect to our UNITAP product line, that is in a test program right now. So there will be a little bit more information to follow. But in both cases here, power distribution blocks and our UNITAP product line, you are stripping wire. So it's not potentially a live connection that you would have say with an insulation piercing connector. Now with the power distribution blocks, yes, it is a solution for the SR rating. Um, however, these are pretty large bulky connectors. So trying to fit these inside of a panel may be a little bit more of a hurdle than say what we're used to prior to this code provision being put into place. Nonetheless, that is the solution that it stands within the Hubble envelope for the SR rating uh, in 2030.46. Oh, and again, that SR being service rated, meaning that we can connect to the service conductors doing our supply side connections, uh, line side taps, people still like to call them, uh, but we are, we're connecting on the supply side of the, the main service panel. And that's kind of what we're focused or main service breaker, I should say, main service disconnect. That's what the focus is uh, for SR or service rated. Absolutely. And uh, to, I do see another question here or, or Duncan says about Ilsco's uh, IPC, that, mm -hmm. that is correct. Our IPC is also does not have the listing. Um, that's kind of in a, a, a testing process. And yes, NSI slash Polaris does have a few taps, uh, multi-port taps that do have the SR rating as it stands today. Great. So uh, in terms of a solution from other manufacturers, that is there, but um, I, hearing feedback from installers, the preference would be to have the insulation piercing connectors be SR rated because of the ease of installation there, not stripping conductors, technically having to shut off that main coming into the coming into the home in residential applications. Yeah, and I feel like it, that's definitely been a, um, I, I could say maybe preferred method or, you know, it, it is the, of all the methods, it's probably the easiest, right? And I know that there's plenty of installers out there that have a love-hate relationship with the insulates, insulated piercing connectors. Uh, again, this gets back to David's comment, read the manual, make sure you're installing them properly. Um, there's you know plenty of things I've seen them go wrong. I've seen them go quite uh, well as at the same time. So uh, not to say that you know, we can't paint a um, broad brush on on the, all those connectors. So, um, but at this moment, uh, to your point, they're not going to be code compliant because of that SR uh, rating. Correct. And and when we think of historically where those IPCs have been used, right? Kind of overhead applications, utility companies. Um, you would think it would be a fit, but there's, because of the codes provisions, there's testing that needs to be done. So, sure. uh, and, and that's currently where we stand. We'll go through um, what those test requirements look like, or at least just a high level overview of what it entails. Perfect. So if we go to the next slide, just we, we sort of talked a little bit about those insulation piercing connectors, ease of installation, torque value needs to be met. Um, there are some insulation piercing connectors out there that have shear bolts or uh, on, on the top of there uh, of the connection, and essentially this removes the need to use a torque wrench. Um, once that bolt shears off, and we we're even starting to see this in say acorns or ground rods, um, you you don't need a torque wrench. That torque value is automatically met once that bolt shears off. Um, in the case of our offering, there is an additional hex head below that shear bolt that if for whatever reason that connection needs to be removed, uh, you can remove that or validate your torque. Uh, but nonetheless, th there's you know even more applications putting into these products to make the installation easier. Uh, it's just this SR rating that is certainly state by state creating some headaches. 
Um, and if, if we move into the next slide, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what makes a connection suitable for the line side of a service connection. Um, and when we talk about the power distribution blocks, piercing connectors, and the insulated port, uh, the, the multi-port connectors, those all require different ANSI test programs. So with each of these connector styles, we're testing the largest, the middle size, and the smallest connector within that product line to three separate test programs. Now the test program, without getting into really deep details, it requires between 125 to 500 current cycle tests. Uh, there are additional mechanical and intermittent resistance tests also required into the, in the middle of that test program. Altogether, we're, we're probably looking at about 500 hours, if not more, of testing required on each individual connector. So there's the, the, we ask, why are we in this place when we had three years to, to prepare? Well, we didn't necessarily have the test requirements from UL for that SR rating. So now here we are, once we have that, we're performing those tests as we speak. And, and to reiterate, power distribution blocks within the Hubble slash Burnley line are SR rated, are insulated multi-port mechanical connectors, similar to what was mentioned previously. Those we should have an answer on that second half of this year. Um, and with respect to the piercing connectors, um, we do have some current, there are is testing not to the ANSI standard that UL requires. That's some justification that's trying to be made, but nonetheless, um, those we hope to also have some type of resolution sometime the back end of this year. So is it, am I getting this right in the sense that um, this was another case where code said we, this has to be listed to a specific listing in this case, service rated, we're calling it, um, but that necessarily didn't exist. Am I understanding that right? So um, it took a little time. I mean, the manufacturers are behind I don't want to, you know, put the blame on you guys, but I mean, behind, behind the um, a ball, I guess, because there was, uh, you know, come January 1st, 2020, there wasn't a standard to just take your products and test to, you're kind of waiting on to get those test protocols. Is that, is that a correct yeah, way? Cl like, clarification, kind of a clarification in parameters, what was mostly the, the, the okay. sticking, um, and, uh, to uh, kind of put a plug in for, for Burnby and Hubble, we have our own UL test laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, I jumped the gun a little there, but uh, so we, we were prepared to be able to perform that test. It was just a matter of what those parameters and the program that was required. Okay. Okay, cool. And then, so, I mean, you, you all Hubble, I mean, and I would imagine other manufacturers are, so now that we have the, the standards, um, you have your ANSI specs and you have the UL standards. So you're going through and doing these um, testing, you're, you're going through and doing the testing at this point. Correct. Yes. And, and for the insulated multi-port mechanical connectors, uh, like I said, hope, hoping second half of this year to have a listing for a certain subset of that. Um, these multi-port con connectors, we make them in two port, three port, four port. And depending on the configuration there, there's opposite side entries, there's dual side entries, there's full through set entries. So those have, might have to go through separate programs. Um, so, and we make them all the way up to 12 ports. There's a lot of, lot of potential testing that uh, we would need to do. We have a, a, a focus right now, mostly on um, say two port, um, specifically for the, the residential solar installations. Okay, so, so you will have to go through and basically your entire product line is gonna have to be tested. It's not necessarily a, a rubber stamp. Once you get one, you can just say the, the manufacturing process is the same. So you're gonna be testing each of those um, the way that you, you described in terms of the number of hours, um, and then each size, I mean, each, they come in size ranges as well. So you're gonna have to do that for the different size ranges. Yeah. Historically, those test programs we'll call them, will go largest, middle, smallest, but then there's different configurations as well. So that sure. you can see how it starts to extrapolate quite, uh, <laughs> quite largely. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Wow. Um, and, wow. Okay. So, um, that's, that's good to know. And so, um, in terms of, I mean, so the, the reality of our situation is a lot like with on the DC side, there's limited options on the AC side. So it sounds like right now, um, you know, your, um, 
distribution blocks would meet that requirement. Distribution block inside of a main panel may or may not be a, a reality, um, you know, in terms of other code requirements and other installation practices. Uh, and so, I mean, there could be some, some time here where um, installers are just a little in a tight spot uh, trying to make these connections. Um, so that's, yeah, an interesting thing. So, and something, and I guess we can, do you have more on this side? It was, nope, I, okay. I think that it'll be a good segue. It, it was gonna, yeah, that kind of made me think of kind of the the NEC, um, you know, where it's in effect. And so Ross, during one of our prep calls, you mentioned to me and it kind of got me thinking, I went and looked a few others. So, you know, we're, you're located in Connecticut. Connecticut has um, their own, they, they put a provision in that, um, this specific code section isn't part of the current code. Uh, and so this is a big you know, thing for our audience is check your local jurisdiction um, because which code, not only which um, code cycle you're under, so 2017 versus 2020 versus 23, uh, but just what the local um, adoption is. And so it sounds like Connecticut uh, has not accepted this or, or maybe not accepted isn't the right way of putting it, but they've um, they're, they're not requiring this SR rating. If is that the the gist of the way they're they're doing it there? Yes, uh, essentially in the state of Connecticut, there is an addendum to the 2020 code. The 2020 code is adopted, but there are it's adopted with addendums that now basically has 2030.46 without the provision for line side ratings. Um, and, and without going through all 50 states, I couldn't tell you which which has what, but um, that, that is something to maybe be cognizant of. Uh, no yeah. the version of the NEC that applies to your project. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so I went and looked. So Oregon actually did the same thing. There's an uh, um, addendum. So we have, um, you know, technically our electrical code is the Oregon Specialty Electrical Code. Same thing, 240 or 230.46. There's strike through on the SR rating on that section. Um, went and looked at the California electrical code. It is what the 2020, 2020 um, national electrical code uh, language is. So that language is in there. So just goes to show, look at your local jurisdiction, understand kind of what their uh, specific re um, uh, requirements are. Um, so great, uh, appreciate that. And so, yeah, um, some of the other key takeaways, you know, installation instructions, on both the AC and the DC side, um, you know, talking with your manufacturers as appropriate. Um, and then on the DC side, you know, the things that David was talking about, the you know, making sure that you're specifying the right co um, connectors to begin with, validating the installation. And then if you can do these uh, periodic inspections, that's great. Um, I did want to, so we're getting close to time, but I think, you know, we've got got a little bit of time. And so, um, David, I saw you were answering some of those questions, but um, we did actually have a couple that were sent in ahead of time. And I wanted to make sure that we talk about um, both over on the on the DC side. Uh, Joseph from TerraSmart sent a, a question in, um, uh, which, you know, for those of you listening, whenever we're doing our topics, if you see something, you have a question ahead of time, you know, you have, feel free to email them in. We're happy to receive those early. Um, but the question was about using aluminum conductors on the DC quick connects. And uh, I can say with, you know, I've talked to Stoibly about this specifically, they say no, um, they're not listed for aluminum conductors with their connectors. Uh, and so, um, David, you know, I asked you earlier, and um, I think you were saying it's kind of a no is a relatively universal answer, but um, again, talk to your manufacturer uh, would be the, the ultimate answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I haven't seen uh, aluminum on the this side for kind of a stringing on, uh, to that level. Yeah, so um, it's a, of course, especially on larger scale, you know, residential is probably not going to apply so much, maybe not even CNI, but as soon as you get into these larger utility scale, um, you know, we're looking to shave off fractions of a penny of a, of a cent to, you know, to save money on these um, systems and aluminum, small aluminum wires would be nice, but that's just not going to uh, work when you're using those connectors. So uh, something to be aware of. Um, the other question that came in that I thought was quite interesting and um, comes uh, around the fact of 
uh, this was from Joel Horst, uh, sent the uh, question in saying, or asking about using alternative methods to calculate maximum DC voltage. So 690.7 allows us to use uh, industry standard methods to, to calculate that. And his question was just about the, the actual rating on the conductors, or excuse me, the connectors themselves. And kind of the, um, the point that he was making was, you know, the conductors are typically going to be at least two KV rated, if not five. Um, he made a comment about inverter manufacturers may actually even be able to uh, be able to, you know, do something over 1500 volts. That would be between you and the inverter manufacturer for sure. That's definitely something you need to verify with them. But the question was, you know, if we actually go over 1500 volts, how do the connectors react? And, you know, it's not one that I feel like we've seen a lot, but it's not to say that it's not a possibility. And so we reached out to Stoyland to talk, ask them about that. Um, and one of the things, um, David, I think this was, you had kind of made this comment is as the systems have gone, gone up in voltage, the connectors themselves really haven't changed. It's they've been listed and they've been tested at higher and higher voltages, but fundamentally they haven't changed. Um, and one of the comments that came back from Stoyby was that part of the UL listing is that they have to be, um, they're exposed to 8,000 volts for one minute. Uh, and so the, going up to, you know, 1501, 1505, 1520 volts or something for a short period of time, probably not an issue, but again, this is, um, maybe even a bigger issue with the inverters, uh, and, um, pieces of electronics that we're connected to. I don't know if you have any anything to add on that one, um, David. Uh, no, I just learned recently from uh, the Stobli team in one of our uh, meetings uh, with the NREL uh, group. So uh, that's kind of what they mentioned as they were going through this uh, historical certification process for both. I think they were assessing this an internal project from NREL, assessing uh, you know kind of their whole history on on connectors, kind of putting that together. So. Great. Um, I see there's some comment about the, the TUV. Um, and I wasn't able to, to kind of digest all that in, um, fully, but um, David, so it sounds like maybe um, Aaron had uh, gotten some uh, different manufacturers through TUV to be listed as uh, intermittable. Am I summarizing that or is that, um, is there something, is jury still out on that one? I, I was still reading it. So I okay. to read through, but I'll, okay. I'll try to find us in a so we'll see if we can get a hold of that. Aaron, maybe we'll reach out to you and see if we can get a little more information and include that in a follow-up with folks. Um, so it sounds like maybe there's uh, some, some potential uh, moving forward um, having different manufacturers listed as intermediable. So to be determined on that one, uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay, um, coming right up at the top of the hour. So really appreciate folks uh, sticking with us, uh, sending in your questions. Uh, next month, we are going to have uh, another AMA, and we'll be talking about the IRA. There's been a lot of new um, developments, thing, um, new rules released, and so we have um, uh, a nice set of um, uh, topics to, to go over on that, and we have a great um, set of panelists to, to kind of go through kind of what it means uh, from manufacturers, uh, EPCs, uh, and then we have um, uh, Kendra also from CSO. Should be a great discussion around how the IRA is unlocking uh, some of these new markets for us. So that'll be uh, Tuesday, June 27th. So hopefully you all can make uh, that one as well. And then finally, you know, if you have questions, um, comments or anything for us, here's how you can reach out to us uh, individually. Um, you can reach out to us here at Mayfield uh, as well if you have anything, uh, any other comments or anything, but, um, and, yeah, so really appreciate, uh, David Ross, your time today taking, taking out to, to share your expertise uh, and all of you in attendance. Uh, thanks for spending your lunch hour with us. And of course, if there's any questions, please reach out and be happy to help. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you all.